pleased to welcome you back to the to the last panel of, of what has really been, uh, I must say, a most engaging conference. And I and I thank you all very much for for being here. And 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 I I am I deal in copyright issues, so naturally my my ears perked up every time I heard the word copyright mentioned. Quoting from the Constitution, saying anything about patents, all of that, you know, just sort of, sort of got got me a buzz. Don't you, don't you agree? And and um, and and I and I can't, I can't help but paraphrase one of the really important questions that came up earlier in the day, and that is, what would it take to convince you to set aside some of your funding? to address these intellectual property issues that are part of the data management, data creation process. So, and, and, and I say that because of one thing, and that is that lawyers are your friend. <laughs> and, and it's, it's very, very important to keep that in mind. So, so with that said, I am happy, I'm delighted, I'm honored to, 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 to moderate this panel and to, to introduce our speakers. You have their biographies. We'll go in a slightly different order for different reasons, but I'm uh, Gerhard Klimek from Purdue will be first, followed by Micah Altman from, from MIT, and then Mark Hanel from, from Figshare. And then Ten Dennis Tenin, my, my colleague here at Columbia, will do the response. And so, please, Gerard. So, what I'd like to share is some of the excitement uh, we see in NanoHub. It has very little to do with data, but, but just bear with me and just for, for 10 minutes, and it might uh, be relevant to you. So, what you see here on the screen is actually uh, usage on a website called nanohub.org uh, in February of last year. And you see green spikes, those are people signing up for the site. The bigger the symbol, the more people show up at a particular time. They turn into yellow dots that run simulations. And then there's a whole bunch of red dots that look at seminars, lectures, and tutorials. So uh, uh, when I thought i get this prepared, I would have thought there's a sine wave of activity running through the globe. But apparently, nanoscientists really don't sleep. <laughs> and and it, it shows it's really a global uh, service that is provided uh, at Purdue for the rest of the world. Um, I, I try to describe that there is knowledge transfer happening in that site. And uh, so that's one part of the topic. And I highlight some items. And then I talk about myth busting. I'm going to talk about all these things we were told we couldn't do because they're so hard and nobody has really succeeded. One way to look at this data is also in a static image. So here are the, uh, the, the users in 2012. Uh, superposed on NASA at night, so basically we keep people up at night uh, all over the world where there is civilization that lights up the sky, more or less. So, so that's a pretty global impact, and you might ask yourself, what are these people all doing, and why are they coming, and what are the incentives uh, for all of this? So if you take nothing away from this talk but these, uh, this one slide, uh, I'll be very happy. You must need meet all the needs for all stakeholders. That means you have to look at the developers. Think of them as providers of products. Now, scientists don't like to be called providers of deliverable, uh, have deliverables, right? They will get really upset, but it, just be with me for a minute. Then you have to have a, a method that is accessible. You have to have a market. And you have to have users or consumers on all of that, of that market. And all three of these entities have completely different requirements. And if you don't meet them, you have a good dream. But if you really want to make this work, you've got to meet the requirements of all of these three classes of stakeholders. So that's what I want to talk about. So we had web forms for a while, since about 1996, and we changed something and we rose up a little bit with growth once we made applications interactive. I'll show you a little bit of uh, what we mean by that. We, there's a lot of talk about MOOCs these days. We started to put lectures and courses on the web. We have over 250,000 users annually now. So, so there, apparently there is a, a need and there's users that come to that. And let's figure out what they all do. We had our own little stock market crash. So um, well, one key message is all free. It's actually provided by NSF. Uh, but really, we don't 
uh, take your credit card or anything. So in, there's many science gateways out there. And there's also then um, a lot of myths out there where users think that you cannot use research codes for education. You've got to write your own custom apps for that. And certainly you can't use somebody else's code for your own research. And experimentalists will never touch that. Um, the developers think building a user interface is way too difficult. I don't have time for that. Um, I must rewrite my code in order to put it on the web. I don't have time for that. And by the way, why should I bother? Because I can write papers myself, thank you very much. And uh, certainly there was no end-to-end -end science cloud that was really accessible. So, so you, again, you have to think of these as customers, you have to think of this as a market, and you have to think of that as suppliers. And if you can make them uh, all ends meet, um, then you have something. So here's a little overview. So imagine you have a site where you can access tools rather readily out of a list. You can launch them. It all runs in a web browser. These are uh, tools that are interactive. They're sort of documented where you can hover over items. Uh, by the way, this is a tool that was generated by an undergrad in my lab in about a week, and he didn't even know what a carbon nanotube is. Well, here you can visualize the density of states of a carbon nanotube. You can hover over data. You can compare nanotubes like this. You can do all of that interactively. You don't do that just for one tool. You do that for many tools. In fact, we have 260 of these tools now. Here's a tool that visualizes a nanobiopore. That's how ions flow through a pore. This is a tool that was built originally at Texas Instruments, where I used to be. Um, then there's a, the next, there's a tool where we build uh, or model artificial atoms. So here's an S orbital and a so-called quantum dot. There's a P orbital. You can compare them. You can do all kinds of things. These are not little gimmick applications. These are scientific applications that might have taken years upon years to write, and they might run on a cloud base. They might run on a grid computing base, completely transparent to the end user because, really, they don't care. They really want to just look at data, examine data, or examine tools and models, all right? So then there's a, a whole environment where you can ask questions, and there's, you can earn nanos for, for contributing. You can spend nanos on a coffee cup or on, on better services. So let me just step out of the video. So you might think of a tool that looks like this, where you can't read what it really means. You'd have to study it for a month before you write your own input deck. That would be a traditional industrial type tool. You can then do fancy visualizations, compare data. We can do that, but we can do one better. We can actually wrap this same tool and make it a little bit simpler so actually undergrads can design what we call a MOSFET, a field effect transistor that runs in any of your computers. And uh, we do that for a couple of tools and suddenly these tools become really usable and we have 6,000 users on a tool or on apps that are wrapped around a real tool and the real geeks really want to run this still here, but we have a whole lot more users that are out there that run the simple app. So user interfaces are absolutely critical. And when I mentioned we had web forms, this is sort of what your bank has today. You fill out some numbers, click query, and you get something you can't do anything with, right? A static GIF image you can't do anything really with. We had that for a while. We have some classroom spikes, but these guys never came back, right? We changed that to an interactive tool like that, and we saw a little bit of growth. Right? That, that's kind of nice, but what's even more compelling is this code is actually an open source code and we track the downloads and suddenly the downloads of this code also drop. So it's actually a nice anti-correlation between usability on the web and the need to install your dang code yourself. Because who likes to install codes? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the one oddball. You can still download it. That's all right. So, so now, but that is not Unusual, right? We all balance usability versus capability. Remember the days when the iPhone came out? People said, what, what is that, right? It can, there's more fancy phones out there for years. Or iPad, right? There's computers like that for many years, but they weren't usable, right? And they, they change our world because these things actually become usable. Not that they were out there before. It's not being about being first. It's about being usable, right? And we know this on a day-to-day -day basis. So what's the normal process to put stuff in the web? It's like this. A proposal says, I got a cool code. I'm going to hire a web developer. The web developer speaks a different language. And it takes this guy over here about two to three years to build a tool that shows up on the web. Two to three years, 500K. All right, 
Which researcher do you know that sits on their butt for three years and doesn't do anything that, to their code? Great, no hands, right? Yeah. It doesn't exist. This guy builds new versions of tools in those two to three years. That means that person will never, ever touch this stuff that's on the web, ever. So there's no point in doing it because this person here would be the ideal person to test this, right? So it's broken. It's by default already broken. So, and if you wanted to do this at 500K per tool and you want to put 88 tools on the web, that would be $88 million. Uh, sorry, 175 tools in four years, $88 million. I can guarantee you NSF does not give us that kind of money. So we do something that's very different, and we try to overcome what the users now think. Right? The users think, well, these are toy tools, right? They're not real tools. They're just gimmicks, right? Or, uh, so they're not real research codes and can't do real research, and maybe I can use it for education. So we, there's actually a bad reputation on science gateways out there. All right, so what we do is we actually eliminate this middle man. We got rid of this person, and we did publish 175 tools in four years. Right? And we do that in one to two weeks. That means we put this guy, the supplier, he doesn't want to be a supplier, back in power. We don't disown him from his own product, and they can put this online in one to two weeks. Now, that's quite powerful because we give them a whole infrastructure where they can do that, a whole framework, workspaces, repository, Git repository, access to grids, staging and testing, and then a publication platform. And then the tools get published with a DOI. That's a whole framework. And one way you can think of that is that's the new machine shop for the next, uh, next generation of developers, right? And this really works. And I want to show you that it works with numbers. So here, number of tools in blue, number of developers in green. So we are 260 tools, some 400 developers as of today. And these, I said, these developers built new versions, right? And they do. We have 1,400 new versions of these codes on the web active. You can think of this as suppliers, products, and product innovation. So these data sets slash tools actually evolve. They're no longer the static tarball zip file that hangs out there. It actually gets supported. And it develops, right? There's not an assumption of perfectness. It actually evolves. Also, the supply chain maybe works. So now, what are the market incentives to drive people there? All right, so we can make charts of collaborators versus number of users uh, served, right? So on a log-log scale, if you have a lot of collaborators, you actually serve a lot of users. You can call that your supplier network, right? If you have the suppliers network with each other, they can actually have powerful products. Let's look at one of those developers, former postdoc in my group, created some 6, 000, uh, eight tools with 6,000 users that are using that. Every provider gets, in a sense, a chart like that. Looks really good on an NSF proposal when you say, I'm going to have an outreach program, because that person has one, quantitatively. So he left, went to southern Illinois. Suddenly, usage at that site spikes up dramatically. He infuses it into his own classroom. He builds new classes. He uses it for research. He gets promoted after two years. That's not bad, especially if, the, uh, if his uh, department head says it's actually his involvement with NanoHub and the leverage is actually good. So there's somewhat of an incentive system to actually change ways. All right, so now we have 260 products. Uh, apparently, uh, it can be done. The myth is busted. Now the question is, what are these people doing? Um, so here is this marketplace, right? Uh, apparently, we're accessible. Let's not argue about that. Um, <laughs> So now the customers are out here. The question is, what are they doing? Because remember, you can't use such thing for education because these are research tools. And by the way, you can't use it for research because you have to write your own tools. Right? So how do we measure that? We have our own matrix where we have to look into the matrix now. We actually look at the behavior of people. Because you can't see, we cluster our user by behavior. They say, show up on a Tuesday, all come for a homework assignment. Or they come throughout a whole semester and use one tool throughout a whole semester, and here's a break. Uh, it's called spring break. And then there's one, they use one, two, three, four, five different tools throughout a whole semester. We can actually positively identify what these groups are. I can't tell you where they are. I'd be in violation of some laws. But basically, sophomores, seniors, freshmen in chemistry, graduates in electrical engineering, sophomores in me uh, mechanical engineering. So a lot of people. We can actually identify these guys that look completely erratic. They're not correlated with experimental researchers, computational researchers. And there's a group we know nothing about. All right, so to give you a feeling, we can do all kinds of things. 
basically we can identify 14,000 students in some 800 classes at 180 institutions that systematically use this site for education, which they can't do, right, because that's impossible to do. And these are research codes. They're not custom codes for education. All right, I think uh, that's a possibility now. Now, the really cool thing is, since everything has a DOI of these tools, we can sort of measure the time to market, or the first time adoption in a classroom. So how long do you think it takes for a tool to be adopted? Compare that to, say, four years of uh, a textbook development, ballpark, for one edition. Well, I can put this, the histogram of it. We have 19 tools that were adopted within a week in the classroom, about 22 adopted within a month. Uh, 31 adopted within three months. Overall, half of the tools are adopted within less than half a year. That's a pretty fast time to market to actually influence how you do education after you discovered something in research. So now, remember you can't do research, right? So now here's an electrical engineer that draws social network charts. Um, 960 papers, each dot is a paper in the literature citing NanoHub. Apparently, you can do research. There's people that might use us as a benchmark. Here's one paper I'm going to skim through. They use us as a benchmark, build their own tool set, compare their own tool against the one that's on NanoHub. But the problem is, where's the data? So that's where we're going to go next. We want to have and keep that data and actually link it in the, in the publication and go back to that data. Experimentalists, they actually use us. These are the color coding for experimentalists. About 30% of the papers involve experimental data. Here's a really cool example. Publication in March of 11, using a tool that was published in April of 10. All right, less than 11 months of publishing a new tool, an experimental group picking it up that has nothing to do with it and using it. And by the way, that group has nothing to do with us. We've become a publication venue. All right, and then they do data and where's the data? That's where we're gonna go next. Um, I don't have to explain H index to this because the first thing I, well, after I showed these social network charts four years ago, they said, well, okay, yeah, you can do research, but is it good, right? So now we're going to measure the secondary citations, secondary citation index, we are at 45. Apparently, it's not bad research either. The point is, you can't, this is an axis of teaching versus an axis of research. You shouldn't separate research and education. Tools actually span both. Let's keep that, you can ask that what that means later. So we apparently are usable across the globe um, and we are transferable. We are actually now not spun out Hub Zero in, out of NanoHub. We're uh, powering some 40 hubs <clears throat> and I don't have time that we actually have some data hubs now that embrace data and actually make data useful. That's not a nano thing so <clears throat> it's one of my team members work but the key is it's all about usability. If you are useful with the data that you so desperately like to host, make them usable, you will find users that will pay for it and make an, eco an economy around it. And then it's a workable thing. Thank you. So, Gerard, if you don't mind my asking, how did you deal with the copyright There's and a, other issues in the, soft, in the new software that they've created? So, every piece of software has to have a license so that we can take it and house it. But most of the software actually is not open source, it's open access. Mm -hmm. So what we provide is a, a venue to see the executable and the user interface. But in general, unless it's a declared open source code, uh, people don't get access to the code. And, and so, so yeah. I'm sorry, and so, so you said among the, for example, graduate students who've developed the software, they are, um, those students, presumably they still own the, the rights and they have given a very broad license, an open access license. That's exactly right. But we don't, we don't disown people and we don't impose a license. Um, about 10% of the codes are open source because, because people want to do that, uh -huh. but we don't enforce it. Okay, so you, you offer up a roster of choices, open access, open source, and maybe even others mm -hmm. in connection with it. And appreciating the difference, open source, really, in, in, in common terms, you're, you're giving it away so that the community of anybody who can work with that code may use it, may enhance it, may, 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 may reapply it, uh, but open access 
is as usability. Is usability. I can get to it. I and reproducibility. It, but maybe not a lot more than that, or not as much. Not as much, and um, you get around a lot of uh, uh, distracting discussions. Yeah, very good. Very happy to introduce Mike, Micah Altman from, from MIT. So, uh, I am a social and information scientist, MIT, and virtually affiliated with Brookings. All work is collaborative, so a number of co-conspirators, lots of stuff on the web if you want to look at more, and the obligatory disclaimer. Uh, so the talk is divided up into three pieces. One, what's the changing research climate? Um, second, how do we maximize impact? This session is supposed to be about impact, so how do we manage, maximize the impact of research through managing research data? And then doing something. So what's the climate for research? Well, one word, more. All right, we've got, uh, we've got the, the LHC producing a, terabyte, a petabyte of data every, every two weeks um, when it's up and running. Um, <laughs> 50,000 people attending courses from, you know, a course from Michigan or Stanford online through MOOCs. Um, 200,000 and more authors on a data set for the Galaxy Zoo. And um, instead of my, my colleagues in political science, instead of fielding surveys every month with a couple hundred people to measure social opinions, uh, public opinion, we can look at 9,000 tweets a second. So there's more stuff, and there's more of everything else, too. Right? And there are also more recognition of some of the problems in scholarship that, that have been there, but are in some ways emphasized by, by this moreness. One is that unpublished data ends up in the desk drawer, and this is uh, literally a bit a, of data that would have been unpublished if uh, Daniel Schechtman hadn't insisted for many years that this aberration um, in his data was not, uh, was not in fact false. And he got the Nobel Prize for quasi-symmetry. But after that happened, people, there were many lab notebooks that came out, and like, hmm, I, I, I found that. <laughs> Too bad. The, the, but the point is, when you, when you get to see everyone's mistakes, you can tell a mistake from a pattern. There's increasing concern about the reliability of the scientific record, and also increasing concern about the erosion of the scientific evidence base. And, and by the way, the compliance, there are many policies that have been issued over the years to deal with, but compliance is as usual, uh, an issue. So one, um, the set of observations come out of this. One is that the practice of science, the researchers' evidence base and publications, they're, they're shifting, and often this is shifting to the edges. Right? Another is that the emphasis on filtering, replication, integration, and reuse, that's becoming more important relative to formal publication. Right? Uh, and uh, at least in some areas, there's an increasing recognition that, that organizations, both commercial and educational and nonprofit, are producing information assets that are, should be durable, have durable value, and are worthy of managing. Um, well, so that's climate. The climate is increasingly favorable, but climate is what you should expect, and weather is what you get. And so there have been shifts in, in, in the weather, many favorable. Um, weather has, this year has brought us in MOOCs, it's brought us in the uh, White House's open access policy, it's brought in copyright cases, uh, Georgia State, it's brought in Amazon Glacier and commercial, um, commercial movement into the data management space in a serious way, uh, into the long-term long access space. Um, and weather will, will continue to blow both ways. So what, what's the theory? So 
in theory, um, I think it's, it's useful to identify what are the goals of the data management. And when you look at various data management plans and institutions, it's clear that there are different sorts of goals that are being um, embodied in plans that are motivating different stakeholders. And these include at least one cluster around orchestrating the value of data to a research group for a specific project. I need to have my data around so I can write my papers, do my analysis. If my postdoc leaves, the research shouldn't fall apart. Right. So that, that's one, one set of objectives for uh, data management. Another is, well, there's this sensitive stuff. It may be stuff that's protected by IP, it may be sensitive, conf sensitive information about individuals, it could be confidential information from businesses, the sites of uh, locations of endangered species, archaeological digs. There's information that we don't want disclosed. And so parts of data management plans and parts of data management policies are focused on this disclosure limitation aspect. And that's, that's another operational goal. There's a, there's, there's a compliance goal, contracts, policies, regulations. And there's a, a dissemination goal. Um, and behind those goals are a set of use values. Right? And you need, when you're thinking about data management and maximizing the impact, using it to maximize the impact of research, you need to think about what, what use values different aspects of your data management are, are impacting, whether it's use by that research team, use by the discipline, use by the wider community, use by the public. And as we get be used by the institution, as we go beyond that research team that controls the data, that wrote the grant, if you know one did, we get into the problem of public goods. Or not really public goods and not really commons either. Right? There, in, in, uh, you know, in the classic uh, framework, there were public and private goods, and then Eleanor Ostrom and company came in and teased out the commons, et cetera. And so what we have are quasi-public goods. Uh, information is non-diminishable and sort of partially excludable, depending on whether it's software, which you can sort of keep people out, preserved data, which maybe you can license, or just best practices, which somehow get everywhere. Or at least they, they don't really get everywhere, but they, they, they could um, to anyone who wants them. Um, and what we know about uh, quasi-public data or quasi-public goods is that they're under-provisioned by pure markets. That a pure market approach never gives you the socially right amount of non-private goods. And so it's, we shouldn't expect this of data either. Uh, so, and, and, and Ostrom uh, has done a lot of uh, Nobel Prize winning work on characterizing what affects quasi-public goods, the commons and other things in that area. What the, and, and, and one of the, the sets of characteristics one should look for are acts and situations, stakeholders, legal and con institutional constraints, and norms and values. All of these are important in successfully managing uh, non-private goods for some sort of social optimum. So one, one area to look at that we've spent a lot of time is the information life cycle. It's important not just to look at one stage. There are stakeholders at each stage of the information life cycle. P different, and different actors care, start to care at different stages, right? which means that if you only focus on one or the incentives of one, you're going to forget about the stakeholders. They're not, and, and you're going to be in, in, in trouble because they'll come in later if you don't catch, catch them at the earlier stages. And there are a number of legal constraints. There are access rights, there are contracts, there are intellectual property rights, and then there are confidentiality restrictions. And the confidentiality restrictions, even in the US, there are approximately 2,000 plus laws that affect uh, data privacy uh, writ largely, um, including if you include things like wiretapping laws in 50 states, and there are different variations, oral um, these apply to um, oral recordings for, for research, possibly, uh, mm -hmm. and, and all of the others. Um, 
data management norms. Some of the, the norms that um, appear important uh, for successful management are information stewardship, awareness of the information life cycle, awareness beyond institutional boundaries and beyond disciplinary boundaries. Much of the value of data management that we're talking about in the social, in, in public sense is the value either to the institution that produced it or the public value. And this often means that the value is captured much later and through reuse, maybe in a different discipline. And uh, where trust, norms only work where there's some level of trust. Right? And there is a, this is a huge community, and so there needs to be um, engineering approaches in place so that that trust can be demonstrated and justified. Yep. So there are a number of operational aspects. Actually, those have been mapped out reasonably well, and there are lots of checklists, and we could go into detail, which we won't. Um, but I think the more important part to look at when you're looking at, at, at data management is what are the requirements for a community information infrastructure? And we've started to tease out some of these. Now, roughly incentives, dissemination, access control, provenance, persistence, legal protections, usability, economic models, trust models. There's a lot, there's a lot going on there. So observations, critically, important to develop coherent, empirically-based economic models for valuing stuff. This is one of the big gaps. How do you, what's the net present, present value, expected value of your big data set? How do you diversify across your data collections to, to maximize the future production of knowledge? And optimal management is gonna require looking at all these different aspects, stakeholders, information, norms, et cetera. So, Practice, you gotta do something, that's all theory. There are many emerging tools, not so many solutions. Most of the tools are coming from disciplines and disciplines often need to do something, which so that's, that's a you know, good driver. Uh, the critical gaps that I've seen in practice are re around research identifiers, citation practices, reproducibility, stewardship, compliance, information privacy and all of that other stuff that we have to deal with. Um, so there are some shameless plugs for projects that I'm actually involved in in one way or another that address, start to address some of these issues. You should pour over these and, and follow all the links and look at them later. Over it, the, with just the main idea is that if you keep all your data in one place or even in one institution, there, you can't protect it from all of the likely forms of risks. So you need to spread your data across multiple institutions. But then you gotta trust them. You gotta trust them to do what they say or to have the capacity to do what they say. So how, how do we strengthen that trust? And there have been a number of approaches in this community. And we've, one of the research approaches we focused on is auditing. Auditing distributed preservation networks to, with a, pro, with a product called Safe Archive, to see that they match up to high human level preservation policies. If you say you got three copies and they're in this region and they're updated, how do we know? Can you prove it? Can you prove it externally without letting us look at the data? And we built some stuff and it turns out that um, distributed, distributing your, 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 your replication, your preservation across institutions is absolutely necessary for, for avoiding these risks. Um, and it also, uh, so it's, it, it also uh, makes it a lot more difficult to figure out what's where your data is. And, and the assumptions, the, the single point of failure is gone. That's the good thing, that's the point. But all of those background assumptions that you collected the data, the copies at the same time, and you follow the same procedures, and that you're speaking the same, you're speaking, you have the same metadata, standards, et cetera, all those things go out the window. And so when you see, for example, that two copies in your, at different institutions are the same, um, that may not, maybe that the collections find it, maybe that the, the software system you use to ingest those things broke in the same way. We've seen that, 
Right? When you see that they're different, it may be that the, the replications are bad, or it may be that your uh, provider is delivering institutionally customized front pages on your journal articles. So that you know, the intellectual content in both institutions is the same, but the bits are different. And these are, are things that you need to deal with in a distributed environment. So distributed digital preservation works, but you need to tune it through evidence and auditing. Mm -hmm. So last slide, semi-solicited advice. Um, so I, I, I have the luxury of uh, being a researcher in a library, um, and I think in a changing environment, any operational problem has the chance of becoming an applied research problem. Um, and so one should aspire to open, scalable solutions that meet the state of the art and practice. Uh, scalable solutions are going to eat your lunch if you, if you don't. And, but you need to expect to do prototypes, experiments, rapid iterations, and yeah, trust other institutions, but verify that they're doing what they should. All right. I just want to first of all say thank you to everybody for hanging around because it's like an, a day of information overload and to see so many people still here is really good. And uh, thanks for everybody for using the hashtag and tweeting because to see that other people are tweeting about this conference from all over the world really shows that the conference is having an impact and that's what this session is about. So <laughs> it's a little fun. But uh, I'm going to be talking about Figshare. So for those of you who don't know what Figshare is, it's um, a platform where any researcher can make or anybody can make any research output, citable, shareable, and discoverable. So just from a personal note, this is where I came from. I, uh, I was a researcher, and I came up from that aspect. I, had, um, I was uh, doing my PhD in the life sciences in stem cell biology, and I had um, a lot of videos, a lot of data sets, and those were, my, those were my research outputs. And at the moment, the dissemination of research content that we have doesn't really help you if you've got videos and data sets. I can tell you now that a year after finishing my PhD, I have three papers out. They have five static images in them, and that doesn't really tell the whole story about what my research was. So as I say, I decided naively it'd be much easier to just set up a platform where you could um, make all of your research outputs discoverable, shareable, and citable. And this is a stock fig share slide, so it was awesome that this session is actually called Discover, Share, and Impact, because we're pretty much on the, on the nail there. But the only other thing that we, we don't have is uh, impact, we say citable, because we're catering to the needs of researchers, and a lot of them don't understand that they, have an, they can have an impact that isn't citations. But we do get our, uh, our everything is citable with a DOI. We get our DOIs from Datacite at the California Digital Library. Uh, if anybody needs some identifiers, I highly recommend working with Joan and the team at the California Digital Library, because they are also awesome. Um, woo! woo. <laughs> And now, related to that, I'm going to have my one humble brag of the uh, talk, which is, um, so we're talking about impact, which is the one thing we're not looking at there. And uh, Datacite put out their most accessed, oh, well, actually, even more than that is uh, discoverability. So Datacite put out their most accessed DOIs in January. Of the, originally, it was the top 10, but they found another one, and Figshare was eight of the top 10. So we're proving we can be quite discoverable. And uh, just an example of what that looks like, um, this was the number one most accessed DOI through Datasite in, the, in January. And you can see it's something that went online in, I don't know if this works. No, I shouldn't have pushed that. Uh, eject. <laughs> but um, you can see that um, this has had nearly 10,000 views. Um, it went online in December, and you say, well, 10,000 views, it's had 60 shares. We make everything shareable via different social networks, and we track these metrics. So 60 shares, so shareable. We've added that little content there. Um, but is this true impact? You know, can you, all this alt metrics that Heather was talking about, is that really impact? Well, this is also, as I say, it came out in December. This, is, this uh, object, research output, has already been cited in Nature. Everything is citable with the DOI. We say, here's how you cite this. You can export it to Refman, EndNote, Mendeley. We just want to make it really easy. Because at the moment, we're saying, why would you want to share your research outputs? Unless you're someone like me, who has a big ego and wants to make all of the, get credit for everything. So suddenly there's that click. Well, maybe every academic has a bit of an ego. So if you can, if you can give them credit for their research in that way, so if you can give their metrics, if you click on this author's 
name on the right there, you will get their cumulative metrics for every research output they've shared. So if they've had 10,000 views for this, they think, well, if I share another one, I'll have 20,000 views and things like this. And it's just playing into that uh, mindset of the academic there. Um, so as I said, the name is quite confusing, Figshare. We, um, for originally for me, so I had a lot of negative data that wasn't going to get published anywhere, so I had all these figures that weren't going to get published. But I did that for a reason. It was, you know, I looked at these cells and I added this chemical and was looking at receptors to see if the levels went up or down, and there was no change. But I did that for a reason. I thought that my hypothesis was there was going to be a change. If I'm doing it, particularly in stem cells, which is massively funded at the moment, uh, then somebody else is going to be doing the same experiment somewhere. But you're never going to write a paper about all your negative data. Who's going to waste three days writing up a paper? So I thought if we can just do something that you know, makes it very easy to share this data, uh, much that you'd share a video on YouTube or a, you know, images on Flickr, because dissemination of content on the internet has been fixed. People have done this. You, know, you can share videos, you can share images, you can share code. So why are we inventing all these uh, odd-looking repositories when we can just copy the systems that have proven successful? So that's what we tried to do. One of the things we do, which was what I wanted, was to visualize the content in the browser. Because not everybody will have that uh, different types of uh, software. Not everyone has Excel, you know? So if you visualize it in the browser, if you visualize the data set, you could play around with it in the browser and see if you want to download it beforehand. And this is just some of the formula formats that we visualize in the browser. Obviously, there's constantly moving goalposts because academics just invent their own file formats. But as opposed to everybody in the world trying to, uh, every publisher trying to deal with this, we're trying to deal with it ourselves, and then they don't have to reinvent the wheel. So that's what we're doing in terms of, you know, we try to, there's these good government pushes at the moment, but we're trying to incentivize people to integrate it into their workflow, to make this sharing of data a normal thing, and you don't even have to think about doing. So two ways in which we're doing that is working with publishers and institutions. Uh, I'll focus more on the publishers. So. Linda was talking about the uh, problems with uh, supplemental information before. We have just gone PLOS, which was built on the internet and is fantastic public library of science. They, up, up until a week ago, their supplemental data was just a list of the files. And you had to, if it was a video, you clicked it, you downloaded it, and then you had to hope you had the right codex to play that video. Which, as I say, you know, the internet works for these things. We can do this. So we now, um, host all of the supplemental data for PLOS. Uh, we make everything visualizable in the browser. 70% of their articles have supplemental data. And if it's a video, you just push play. It's like a little slider. You can see everything, all the supplemental data, and see the real things that might want to be in the uh, article. On that note, we're working with Faculty of 1000 Research, where the actual uh, data, if, it, if, if figure one is a data set, then we make figure one the data set. It's all, the, the journal is online, so you don't need to make a screenshot of a data set. It's a data set that you can play around with. If it's video, it, the video is there. It's a file set with 50 files in, you can just click through them. And so um, my, favorite, my favorite paper that's come out of that so far is something that I always wanted, which is uh, they have graphs, uh, the figures. And if you click the figures, the data behind the graph pops up, which is really cool, I think. But that's just me personally. And as I say, Elsevier have done this before. They um, uh, they've had some problems with, um, with their article of the future when repositories will close down. And that is a problem, so we're trying to be a central repository where they, you don't have to work with 15 different repositories as a publisher, you can just work with one. Um, this is an example of the supplemental data on PLOS, I should have clicked on a minute ago. And as I say, that's, that's just the, what the supplemental data looks like. You know, but a spreadsheet data is hard to fit into a, a sub info section on a paper, so we have this overlay that'll pop it up and you can play around with the data, uh, all the macros are enabled and stuff like this. Um, so with regards to institutions, we, we do things for the individual researchers. It's all free for individual researchers. Um, you can upload stuff, you keep it private, and you choose to make it publicly available. There's, um, as I said, we, we track the metrics. So we, the way we incentivize users to share their research data is to give them things like badges, which dynamically show you how many uh, views and shares and what have you you've had of your research. So people put these on their blog. We see people tweeting all the time. I've just gone past 10,000 views on Figshare. Uh, we have a desktop uploader, which is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you can just drag all your files in, much like Dropbox. It stores them all privately. You can add some metadata and choose to make them uh, publicly available. 
We have an API. So this is really where I think we need to get to. You, you, if you make a, we're at the stage now where it should be become not should I share my data, but where should I share my data? And once we get to that stage, that's when the really cool stuff happens. And with FigJ, through the API, you can say, give me every bit of spreadsheet data with these tags in this category in the last six months, pull it all out, hope to do some crunching and really build on the research that other people have done before. Uh, and as I say, we're working with institutions now to provide institutional FigShare accounts so that they can manage all of their research data privately in the cloud and access it from anywhere. So if anyone wants to talk about that, second shameless plug. Um, <laughs> and so the impact of things. Um, we heard Heather talking about impact story. There's also altmetric and plum analytics. The problem here is I said we make things citable. And people like the idea that things are citable. They're not getting around to the idea yet that there are other metrics. You know, we track views, shares, downloads, and things like this. Places like Impact Story, Altmetric, and Plum Analytics, they're doing this on a much bigger scale. Figshare is on all three of those, and you can track the details in much more data. Uh, much, you can see what's happening a lot better. But the funders aren't really tracking this at the moment, whereas they are saying we should be making research data available. They're not really looking at the impact side of things as much as they should, so please encourage them to do this. And so this is kind of the unknown section for me. I have a few questions that I was going to mention just in terms of, uh, you know, because this is a panel, might as well have some questions. Yeah. So, you know, the Thomson Reuters are doing a data citation index that's going to start tracking these things, which is really interesting because uh, Web of Science and the, you know, I've just been talking about different alt metrics. Do we really want to go back to that? one measure of impact uh, for uh, data sets. Well, I mean, they are tracking Figshare data sets, so they're more than welcome to do that. Whether that will be the future of where this goes, I don't know. I'd love to hear people's opinions. Uh, same with, I've just heard about the Elsevier uh, new tools, so I'm really interested to hear where this goes. They've said all the data is going to be open as a priority, and that's really great. Um, one thing that I think has a lot of potential we've heard mentioned before is ORCID. Um, so if you're looking at the impact of a researcher, ORCID is basically an ID for a, a researcher, a prison number for a researcher that everything's connected to them. And so you could use that to start tracking people uh, and seeing what their true impact of all of their research is. And uh, we're, we're integrated with that, so we're looking forward to see where that goes. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention was just this, you know, the US government has re announced last week uh, the UK is actually ahead on, on this front in that we make, we're already making all of our stuff open access, which is great. We're winning at something. But um, <laughs> the, 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 yeah, the, US, the US will catch us in no time with this. One of the interesting things I wanted to ask everybody here is uh, I, mentioned, I talked to a few people about this last night. They say that all of the papers have to be open access. They don't really say uh, what the embargo period has to be on data. So they treat it completely separately still in the in the release that they gave. So I think we should push them to see what are they going to do on the data sharing side of things. Um, the impact side of things, how are we going to manage that? And are we going to start tracking these new metrics? And the last thing I wanted to say was, uh, how are we going to start educating the masses about what they can do? On my, uh, I think everybody on the first day of their PhD or master's should get an email saying, this is what you can do with your data. This is what you can't do with your data. Because we see, uh, somebody mentioned it before, we see two peaks in the people who use Figshare. We see undergrads who grew up with the internet, uh, sorry, postgrads who grew up with the internet and know how to control the access and the uh, privacy controls on, on websites. And uh, we see tenured professors who are like, this is how it should be done. Let's just do it. Let's just throw it all out there and who cares what happens. Uh, whereas the postdocs are the ones who are terrified and they will only do things if they are told to explicitly do it and it will help their career. So people need to be educated. And so for all the people at institutions here, please tell all your researchers. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Providing commentary. Professor Dennis Henry. Churchill. Uh, Churchill. You can, you, can be, you can be guaranteed that the US does the right thing after they tried everything else first. <laughs> So, so thank you all. Uh, my name is Dennis Stan and I'm an English professor. Uh, and you might be wondering what I'm doing here. And I'm, what, I'll, what I'll do is uh, I'll first start with an anecdote. Then I'll try to weave a thread between these three talks. And then I'll talk about 
what I think is the elephant in the room. Uh, it's not all severe, guys, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> but we have to make fun of you a little bit. But, um, all right, so anecdote, thread, elephant, that's the plan. So, so the, el the, the anecdote first is that uh, we, I'm right now, uh, me and my students and some other colleagues are launching kind of a uh, humanities-based lab, and it's a database lab, and it's, it's about piracy and the impact of piracy on literary culture. And we're dealing with data in the English department, in the history department. Uh, we have about 12 terabytes of full text data. We have metadata. Uh, we have XML uh, data dumps. We have um, sales data, this kind of stuff. So, and we have in the humanities, we don't really have a culture of, of sharing data, of keeping data, except for, of course, the traditional culture, the library, the journal, and so on. So, uh, so the first thing we did, and I actually did this yesterday. I'm not, this is, not, this is very timely. I sat with my students and said, what's, what's, what is our platform? What, what are we, how are we going to set up this environment? So, and platform, it's the, the word that was used here, platform, and I'm thinking, what is a platform? What exactly is a platform for sharing, discovering, impact, and so on? And, I'm, and I'm kind of, I, I just wrote a bunch of kind of keywords here. So platforms, uh, they're, they involve some expertise. They, invo they involve certain practices, editorial practices, sharing practices. There are licensing schemas, as you said. There's architecture. There's norms, as you said, institution, trust, training, as, as Mark said, um, there is uh, architecture, infrastructure, right? That all goes into the platform, right? So, so as we look out there, oh, actually, let me make an aside. We all agree that sharing, discovering, impact, that's all good. And, and I, I think very few people will say no to open access and no to uh, open source and free culture, this kind of stuff. But okay, that's fine. But as I look out there, and as me and my students and my colleagues, we look out there, we see a great proliferation of platforms. I mean, just look in front of me. Uh, here go. There is a UC3 that wants us to keep uh, our data with them. Web Archiving Service uh, says that they're a good platform. Sci Vel says, come with us. Uh, Figshare, right? Uh, and they're all, and I asked you this before the panel, I said, are you, are you guys in competition with each other? Do you view yourself as kind of, and, Mark said no, which is true. I'm sure, I'm sure everybody here can explain their own little niche, but looking at this whole ecosystem from the outside, it is a very confusing ecosystem, right? So on the one hand, you see this great, you see um, these platforms that are much more transparent than the old system. They're much more accessible, right? Uh, they're le there's less friction. They look better, they feel better, right? They're, they have the right spirit. But on the other hand, you have this great fragmentation, right? Uh, it is difficult to train our students, our faculty, in using new platforms. There is actually a lot of friction to getting a whole discipline moving in that direction. We see incompatibility. Will, will, should I post my data on all of the above just to be kind of just to advertise? Or is, is, is it going to be compatible? Is it going to be stable enough? Will in two years there'll be even more and kind of better looking platforms and more accessible platforms? We don't know. Uh, uh, so the st stability is also a problem. So that's, what, uh, that's kind of my little provocation. That, that I think is the tension in the room. That's the elephant in the room. Uh, and I would love to hear the responses, your responses uh, on this and maybe the, our panelist responses on this problem. Thank you. Excellent. Well, let's take some time for comments from, from the panel, and then we'll turn to uh, audience questions. I have a comment on diversity of offerings and marketplace. Um, you don't have an, an iPhone, so, but something similar. So did you read the 200-page manual for that? Uh, for this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong person to ask. I wasn't asking you. I was asking the person that. Uh, okay. um, last time you rented a car at the airport, did you really take uh, the whole engine apart to make sure all the screws are there and reassemble the whole thing? Tougher. Now you're getting tougher. So the point is, we have we have over years established certain um, methodologies, right? The early cars, you were rich. You actually hired a driver who could fix the thing on the way while it was breaking down, right? You actually had a driver because you were a rich person. You wouldn't drive that thing yourself. 
grid computing for a long time was like that. You hire somebody that drives the grid for you and somebody conducts this experiment. Uh, we have moved into an, an age where most people are not willing to put up with that. So I started using Dropbox, for example, some two years ago, whenever it roughly came about three years ago. It changed how I do things. I never read a manual. So unless it becomes intuitive and it, bends, it, it embeds itself in our day-to-day -day workflow, we're doing something wrong because we all are busy and we have enough stuff to do. Mm -hmm. And the time to learn something new is probably between 2 and 3 a.m. Um, that's it, right? And, and, and this is this, you can add this to the list of qualities of a platform. Intuitive is the word, easy to use, adaptable, because these, all of these technologies are going to be in a steady state of change for the rest of our lives. And as we're hit with new opportunities, new needs, new demands, we have to phase into them very, very gracefully. So I, I am. So that's. I think that's that's too nice. So for me, platforms also they don't allow you to escape. Mm -hmm. So for example, I did not change to Android for a long time because all my contacts were on my old Nokia, and now all my contacts are with Google. It is very expensive for me to switch to another exactly. phone. There's so a platforms. Inertia. They, yeah, there is inertia in platforms, so it, it is difficult for me to see how in this environment of fragmentation, how, you know, platforms, they by uh, protocols and norms, they work best when there's one platform. Right. And when we are all on Facebook, that's, what, that's when we can do, It's you hard know, to go someplace uh, else. Yeah, so that's what I don't yeah. get. What's the, the, fi the kind of the final state here? There must be either huge integration or just... Uh, kind of whittling of the market until there's kind of a clear, clear, or several winners or several yeah. alternatives. Yeah, and I think that will happen. The, the reason I said no when you said, do I count all of these different uh, places as competitors is because at the moment, there's so much data that there's enough data to go around all of these places. You know, still we're just at the tip of the iceberg. But in terms of, um, on both of these points, you know, we all the public data is backed up in, uh, on Figshare is backed up in clocks, which is another great, in, uh, organization and that stands for controlled locks and locks is lots of copies keep stuff safe and that is true and there might be some redundancy in this but there's things like sword app where you can push from one repository to another repository and we're very much of the idea that you if you I didn't use my institutional repository because it was clunky and if you need to do a webinar to use something I'm never going to use it if I needed a webinar to use Facebook I wouldn't use Facebook now but um, mm -hmm. so it has to be intuitive so if you can get that intuitiveness on one platform, as you say, I'm not saying it's Figshare, it could be any, one will uh, be the one where people start using it. But that should then push to your institutional repositories, and it should then make, you know, if, if something belongs in GenBank, it should automatically push to GenBank. So we can do this, the technology exists, uh, and I think that is the way to go forward. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Barring any other quick comments, I think it's important for us to turn to the audience with questions. and. Um, I'm not sure, Catherine, you want to manage the, the question? She'll be coming around with a microphone here, and we'll sweep across the room. My name is Daniel Kelto from Elsevier. Uh, research is a global enterprise, and I think open data and open access uh, really assume a level, of, um, a level of reciprocity. Now, we know there are high-trust and low-trust societies that hold different values. So my question is particularly to Micah, but can the panel comment on um, the cultural kind of impacts of things like high, high levels of trust or low levels of trust and willingness to contribute to open data, et cetera? Well, I mean, trust, high levels of trust and low levels of trust are, are generally not across the board. It's trust in whom for what. Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the interesting things I find about open data and open access in general is the, the proportions of benefits that, that has been, uh, uh, that has fallen to uh, relatively low trust societies outside the US. For example, we're one of the projects that I briefly pointed at the um, the DVN OJS project, which is creating a a workflow for publishing 
replic open replication data in conjunction with uh, open access articles. Um, OJS is a system for hosting open access journals. It's developed in Canada and Stanford, has 10,000 journals. Most of these are in, in other countries and, and, and a big, uh, a large proportion in Africa because it, there's a, a low barrier to entry for it. So um, I think that the, the impact, uh, there's even more to gain in societies that, and countries that are uh, more close than the U.S. More closed and developed, yeah. Oh, Good. Less developed. Um, Catherine has, oh, here comes the microphone. We saw hand up over here. Uh, good afternoon, Richard Wynn, Airy Systems. Um, one of the benefits of closed access systems is that there's a feedback mechanism. Uh, if a product is sold and it's successful, people pay more and there's sustainability. If the product is no good, then the money stops and the product disappears. And I think part of the challenge with some of your systems right now is there's not that feedback mechanism. And so I think it would be useful uh, to tell us how your projects are funded and what will happen in the longer term uh, when that funding stops. So, so I, let me um, respectfully disagree that when I mean, you've seen forms of feedback on at least two sites, uh, we keep track of usage. People vote with their feed in terms of um, what they use and what doesn't get used. That is being fed back to the author. Authors have rankings. Authors can earn currencies or can earn values. They might be able to trade those values down the line. Um, right now, NanoHub is funded from the NSF. It was uh, started as an infrastructure and research network, ran for 10 years. Uh, we turned it into a national infrastructure and we got funded for another five plus five years just now. So NSF sees value in it and yes, it's federal funding. At the end of the road, uh, in 10 years, what I would love to see in terms of sustainability is a, a nano-hub society in where people actually participate, they use the material, they contribute just like IEEE or and they don't mind spending $50 or $100 a year to participate in this organization because they derive day-to-day -day benefit. That's a dream, okay, I'll give you that. But, uh, but there have to be ways of financial sustainability and going to a market that actually pays for these things. We can't always just assume that some sort of government, socially um, beneficial or not, is gonna pay for that. But if you had asked me 10 years ago, or many people 10 years ago, if I had listened to computer scientists, they would have discussed till today what kind of data format we need to use and how to dis, dis, uh, distribute. We were more with a shut up and do it kind of philosophy and actually did it. And then we can talk about currencies or value systems, right? So I don't, I, sometimes it's try and then apologize later. Yes, please, please do. Uh, I, I'd like to, I've got a strong voice. Well, they need it, they need it for the, for the, the webcast. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I'd like to follow up on that. Um, a absolutely. Um, and it's interesting to hear you say that eventually you do see a commercial model for NanoHub. Um, I'd also uh, like to hear from Figshare it on the be, same point, because it could be, could be non-profit, right? It could be self-sustaining. It doesn't have to be generating profits. Yeah, but, but for for example, the publishing done by the American Chemical Society is non-profit. Right. Okay, so uh, but it's not open access. So, or, or it's mainly not open access. So the question is long-term sustainability, because in the short term, obviously things can be funded with entrepreneurs, venture capital, uh, funding from agencies, etc. But in the long term, it's the sustainability of the model that will make sure that those data are there 10 years from now. 
Uh, so just to answer the fig share side, do you want to jump in before I no, say that? No, no, I'll jump in after. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> uh, just, so fig share is a commercial company. We, uh, are looking for a, uh, we are looking for sustainability. The way we do that at the moment is to sell to publishers and to sell to academic institutions. Uh, the examples I showed, Plus yeah. and Fact of a Thousand Research, are customers of Figshare. Uh, Peter, in his earlier talk, mentioned you know he'd like to see what happens with Figshare. What you know, will we be closed, putting up walls at any stage? We've already always categorically said that it's free for individuals who want to make their research outputs publicly available. If you make it publicly available, it'll always be publicly available. Uh, if uh, our sustainability model doesn't work, as I say, everything uh, is backed up in clocks, so those DOIs will always resolve to the object that you uh, have uploaded. Um, and, and just one extra point there, I did have, at the beginning, we did, I, I did look to see whether to go through the, acade making it an ap academic project was the way to go forward with it, and uh, uh, Welcome were interested, and we nearly went with them until they said they had the perfect grant, but uh, you needed five years postdoc experience, so it wasn't exactly perfect. You know, they made you jump through some odd hoops. Uh, but I'm so happy that we didn't now for the reason that if you can't get any more funding, then that's kaput. You know, it just goes. We don't have a job. Yeah, Mike, do you want to add to that? Sure. I, I, I think you make a very good point. Um, I was... Uh, I was trained in a thinly disguised, what was at that time, a thinly disguised economics department, so I learned classical economic uh, micro theory and, and all the rest. And one of the beautiful things, one of the most beautiful things about private markets is how they aggregate information. Price is a signal of value, right? And so with, when you're not selling things, you're losing this signal. Right? And that's a very important uh, aspect, the institutional design consideration. The problem with that is that works in markets when goods are private, right? When, when goods are excludable, when they get used up, the theories that otherwise they're not such a signal of value. They're a signal of value to particular people who are above a particular threshold, but not, they don't capture all of the, the potential value, right? So, uh, Open access become is an imperfect, has imperfect signals of value, but the markets have imperfect signals of value for these goods as well, right? And in the projects that I've been involved with, they have been almost always ex initially funded by a mixture of uh, volunteer effort, which is how academia works in part, and um, and federal or foundation funding with the idea that we would get institutions addicted to them, that the institutions, uh, research institutions, would find these things to be so useful that they would continue using them. And that's, in fact, what's, what's happened. And you can, you know, Harvard has taken over, for example, the Dataverse Network, which as uh, part of their, their library service. And you can think of Harvard as a university, but you can also think of it as a large hedge fund with a, a smaller <laughs> research group attached to it. Um, you know, so, and it's not clear, as I said, there are many, you know, it's not clear what the future of the universities are, but Harvard made their, they got their competitive advantage by introducing merit-based tenure after, in the 50s, after, World War II GI Bill, and now universities are looking to not only capture the best faculty, but to capture the best students through massive open online courses to capture the world's best learners and employ them. And the, and the, and the organizations that do that are gonna have a huge competitive advantage, and a lot of that requires that the students be able to access this material. So there is a, there's a huge institutional interest in creating a body of intellectual content that is openly accessible, and then capturing the best of the best for your research enterprise. Mm -hmm. Catherine, you got another question? And then you, you tell us, too, how we're doing on time. Hi, Holly Falk Krasinski, also from Elsevier. And we're not trying to grab questions, but we noticed there was a gender imbalance of asking questions. So I'm representing the women, not Elsevier, with this one. OK, um, so I have a question. And it could be for this panel, but it could be for any of the panelists that came before. Um, and that's a question of bad behavior. I'm a little bit of a cynic, um, 
And, and I, I, I readily shared, I spent the last 15 years in, at Northwestern University in academia, started a nonprofit, worked at my synagogue that was a nonprofit, got management training in nonprofit, and, and then just moved to Elsevier. So I, I like nonprofit and I like sharing. Um, until the day that you Google, your Google search shows up some piece of work that you did that somebody else is claiming as their own with absolutely no attribution to you, to your institution, to your work, no additive value to your reputation. So what I haven't heard in any of the panels really is how we deal with bad behavior. We're making the assumption that to test reproducibility and the validity of data means that the people who will come after you will be as ethical and will not engage in misconduct. And what they report on will also be good information, but we have no way to guarantee that. And so I'd like to understand more about how the open environment, though, also helps to protect the individuals who, in our academic schemas, rely on being recognized for individual accomplishments and are rewarded in a very stringent structure that when you don't get promoted and tenured, you lose your job. It's very finite, it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's severe. And so we need to think about that. And I think it gets to your point of the postdocs. They're trying very hard at this point to, to move from, uh, from the trainee to independent and they have to prove their independence, their individual self-worth and any risk to that being taken away even a little bit is severe to their professional development. And I just haven't heard a cure or even a guard for that. I have a one-liner answer, but you plagiarize, you lose your job. No. Yes, you no. do. No, the person who plagiarized my stuff didn't lose his job. Well, did you catch him? Did they go to the university? Yes. Wow. Okay. Yes. Yes, because you might guess for me, I'm not good at just sitting by and letting things go either. Yes. So no. Those consequences didn't happen, in fact. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that we deal with it the exact same way that Elsevier deals with it. If someone was, we have, you know, there, there is no solution to this at the moment. We, you know, a member of COPE, which is publication ethics, we have standard takedown procedures, but there's no solution until this happens. You know, if, if I was to go and copy someone's Elsevier paper and publish it somewhere else as my own, how are you going to track that? Um, so at the moment, I. I don't think there is a solution. I don't know if it's a big enough problem for people to throw in, you know, all of this uh, effort into it. But obviously, if you've been stung by it, then it's the most important thing in the world. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe someone else does. Yeah, no, it's very yeah. important. Can, can I jump in on this one? Is is so tr tr all merit-based systems can be exploited, including traditional ones. We know from traditional publishing, there is plagiarism. There is data, made-up data going on all the time. And the best cure for that so far that, that I think we've seen is transparency. When there are new practices that encourage uh, scientists and hu humanists to share their data, the original data, to publish code along with the data, uh, that transparency is what cures, uh, uh, cures, I think, those kind of abuses. And what is nice in this new platform, many of these new platforms are more transparent. Same, same thing can be said about the merit-based system. If tenure process was more transparent, I think it would also be healthier. So. Right. It, it, is, tra is transparency a cure, or does it only get you to where you are already when you ask the question? Does it only get you to the point where you can find it? Is it really a cure? It stops a different problem, so it stops people making up data. If you demand to see the data, that's why I said that paper that you click the graph and see the data behind it, I love because I was always in journal clubs thinking, why have they displayed the data like this when on all their other graphs they've used a different axis? <laughs> and it's because they're fiddling the data to get a significant result, which is obvious. But if you have that transparency, then you overcome that problem. It's it, a completely separate issue to the uh, plagiarism. It, one. It, it's, well, sometimes, sometimes not. Sometimes it's a cure if, you, in a, in, if you're in a... Um, environment where you typically publish preprints, you put your working drafts on archive, you share your data initially, it's very hard to then take over at the time of publication and say, have somebody else claim to do that work. Because you have a record of, you have a record prior to that work being worth being taken over. Right. Um, but I'll have to go back to, to Kranzberg's laws, right? Technology, these are huge changes in information technology. Technology is neither good nor bad. Neither is it neutral, right? It changes the game, right? It means if you put your stuff out, if you do open lab science, you're much less likely to be plagiarized, but somebody could get the jump on the next step, 
right? If you kept all your research clustered, right, maybe you, nobody's going to grab it, um, but you still have the, you know, the, the, first, the first discoverer problem. Mm -hmm. Right, and and so you could be working for years, and nobody plagiarizes you. But if you don't publish first, it's all for naught. Right. So there are different. It's a different system, and it has its advantage. It can be gamed, and both can be gamed in various ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I would just say, don't be discouraged. Um, you you know, I deal with the plagiarism question. I deal with the copyright infringement question all the time. They get mixed up. They're not the same, but they're they're akin to one another. But I deal with them all the time. And, and you know, the, the questions, the conversation often it boils down to this, yeah, you have rights, but there's not much you can do about them. The, the, it, and so, so, so part, it's part, part of the challenge uh, as, we, as we have already moved into, into this digital environment, our content by one means or another will be out there. Uh, and I get the question all the time, so how can I control it and make sure somebody doesn't misuse it? And the answer is largely, you can't. Um, and, and so it, it's, it's so so some misuse in inappropriate use is is uh, honestly it's part of the cost of the inevitability of where technology has taken us. So, um, another example, maybe trivializing it, there's 14,000 people dying in the United States from car accidents. Uh, I don't think we're going to outlaw cars and streets anytime soon. Yeah. So, um, I mean, there is a sort of a Balance. Okay. And um, I hear, see, see, waving with a question over here, and this will be our last question. Um, I'm Lisa Rosewiles, science librarian at Seton Hall, but I used to be a behavioral ecologist in my past life. And this is back to this idea of long term sustainability. I'm thinking, gee, I have a ton of data from my graduate work, like reams and reams and reams of it, which I would happily make available, though Lord knows why anybody would want it. The thing is, it was coded in a computer program that a friend of mine wrote just for me, downloaded to DBase, uploaded to SPSS, like version two. I don't think it's usable anymore. Um, in a similar vein, I had a question at the reference desk the other night, somebody who had some ancient data from the 60s from a government site that was, I couldn't even figure out what it was. I mean, I think it was just basically in binary code. So my question is in terms of this long-term sustainability, we have all this wonderful stuff that we put in repositories, but things change very rapidly. Something that's current today, I mean, is there any guarantee that an Excel file I put in today, you'd be able to read five years later? And who would do all the continual upgrading to new versions? That's a big cost. So we're, we're looking at this with regards to, uh, one way you can do it is if you make, if you convert everything to an open data standard format, then the idea is that you could say, okay, so if, you, if it's an Excel file, you can convert it on the fly. So you should be able to download it as a CSV or something like that. We haven't got this implemented yet, but it's something we're doing. But it is because there is such a sheer volume of files. We, can't, we might not be able to save things going backwards, but you know, this is another education thing. People should be educated to put their files in a non-proprietary format maybe, which if you use SPSS, maybe you're not going to, but yeah. Okay, and our, I'm afraid our time is up, and, and I want to give a round of applause for our great panel, and thank you all very much.